Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. I hope you're taking care. Um, welcome to you, like I always say, anyone or anything that joins you today. Um, we're here for Sparks Knowledge Equity Series, Session 3, really going by. Um, and today we'll be talking about or um, sort of examining and thinking about the roots of uh, the university, academic research and education in violence against indigenous communities. Um, as folks trickle in, I'll try to do a shorter settling in just because we've already had two sessions and you've heard me speak long enough. Um, you know, if you were here, welcome back. If you're new, um, just to introduce myself a little bit, my name is Kanishka Sikri. I'm a writer and a PhD candidate at York University in Toronto. Um, and much of my research is focusing on epistemic violence and violability and the sort of tricky ways that um, certain lives are assigned the possibility of violence. Um, so I'm joining here today with a black shirt, my big hair as always, and I have a blue background um, that gives some contrast in comparison to the pale, um, to the pale wallpaper behind me. Um, and I want to just settle in with a sort of note about the land. Um, you know, as we've been talking about in the past two sessions, it's very tricky giving land acknowledgements because they are so performative. Um, but at the same time, what does the gesture of acknowledgement, what does the gesture to remember and reconcile genealogies and context um, mean for the work we're doing in the university and in education and research? So. I invite you and myself to think about this land um, here in Toronto, the here in Wendat, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit who have taken care of the land that I'm on, the many Indigenous peoples who are not formally recognized by the Canadian settler state. Um, I've talked a lot about the official land acknowledgement from the city of Toronto and how it does not mention at all the histories of violence um, through the genocide of Indigenous peoples, as well as the forceful theft and removal of Black and Brown peoples on to this land and how the words of reconciliation, truth and, you know, truth and indigenous resilience, um, they're kind of robbed of this genealogy and context when we hesitate to name what is happening on this land. So I'm trying to invoke that genealogy and use it as a point of departure in my own work. And I invite you to do the same as well. Um, like always, few ways to mark this space. There's a live transcript and a Zoom recording will be shared with you afterwards. Please share constructive questions thoughts, feedback into the Q&A function in Zoom. Again, the chats are closed, so we will be monitoring the Q&A, and then we will incorporate those questions into the session itself. Um, so that's a lot. As always, let us begin. Um, I think this session is really at a unique junction. We have been asking how we recognize the violences of research and education and change our work to repair those violences. In our first session, Dorothy Berry really connected us to the loud absence in systems of knowledge making. And in the second session, we sort of further this to think about Sadia Hartman, um, the ways that we fill in histories when histories themselves have intentionally been recorded fragmentarily. Beth Patton here really reminded us the work of finding and archiving those histories as important to challenge epistemic violence and epistemicide. Um, so I'm inviting Stacy, Robin, and Carolyn here. All of you are working to understand and transform the ways knowledge and data organization perpetuate anti-Indigenous violence. And this is a rather large question, um, but I'm posing it in the hopes that you are also able to introduce yourself in this question as well. But we'd really like to begin with understanding how knowledge preservation, data governance, as these sort of systems and structures, as well as mundane practices and processes, perpetuate the violences of settler colonialism. Um, I'm going to pass this question to each of the panelists um, and give them a chance to introduce themselves as well, and then we can take this conversation where it goes. So please feel free, um, audience here, to enter your questions as you feel fit. I'm going to start by passing it over to Robin, if you feel ready. I'd love to hear your thoughts here. Uh, I come to you all today from the traditional territories of the Atikamikshing, Anishinaabek, and the Wanapate First Nation in what is colonially known as Greater Sudbury, Ontario in Canada. Um, I just started a PhD at, um, sorry, postdoc, I completed my PhD, now I'm doing a postdoc at uh, Queen's in, um, you know, some really, really advanced Indigenous sovereignty data, AI and medicine 
um, lab. So I'm pretty excited about that. And I'm really grateful to be here. And just kind of thinking a little bit about this question around knowledge preservation and data governance. So for me, I, I can speak to this question from the space of uh, Indigenous data sovereignty. This is a, a movement uh, that was born of necessity due to many atrocities that have and continue to face Indigenous people. Indigenous data sovereignty is about the assertion of Indigenous people's inherent rights. So rights that we are born with, um, that are not granted, that are not earned, that simply exist. And those rights exist in spaces where Indigenous data and knowledges exist. And so in order to assert Indigenous data sovereignty, Indigenous scholars and allies and folks around the world, including Canada, have developed uh, models and frameworks and different ways that um, we can really think about and govern the, the respectful uses and protections over data. So in Canada, for example, we have the First Nations principles of ownership, control, access, and possession that is about uh, you know, who owns, who controls, who accesses, and, and where does it reside in the world? Um, in, it's called OCAP. Um, and globally, there's also the care principles for Indigenous data governance that also speak to the collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics of Indigenous data. Again, these movements were born out of necessity in a world where Indigenous peoples, territories, and knowledges uh, really have been, to put it lightly, inappropriately used by scholars, scientists, and others for more than 500 years. So I spent the last several years myself um, researching and working in the space of Indigenous data sovereignty, really understanding its progression, and really what that means for all of us moving forward into the future. And so as we move deeper into this world of automation and machine learning and so much more as technology increases, what I and other scholars are really noticing are the many silences that are not being shared with our communities when it comes to how research is done and how data are collected and how data continue to exist and be um, extracted and uh, misappropriated. So the system that we exist within really continues to perpetuate um, you know, just these, these so many different um, harms and the narrative that ultimately benefits Euro-economic advancement. And this is continuing to happen within our academic systems because we're also overworked. And, and by that, I mean both Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples alike. But unfortunately, what happens is that it leaves so much space for things like government efforts to really move in and create changes to our systems that contribute to global advancement in um, a colonial way, again, for the benefit of colonial powers but there's just not enough time being spent understanding the interdisciplinarity of our systems. And in order to do better, we really need to ensure that all of our work is respectful of indigenous knowledges, but also respectful of the areas of indigenous knowledges that may not be attuned within this fast paced changing technological world. And really we need to keep up with um, all of the different ways and the webs of social political and most importantly, environmental harm that the advancements of these systems are making. For example, the mineral and resource extraction required in order to operate the technology that we're saying will solve humanity's problems. Lithium batteries being one of the biggest contributors to environmental harms. Things that should be considered more pressing, and in my belief, would be more greatly considered if indigenous knowledges were being genuinely considered within spaces um, that are asserting humanity's advancement, but we aren't getting the full picture as Indigenous peoples. We're just getting you know, the convenient pieces. Go ahead. Thank you, Robin. I'm gonna pass it to Stacy, and feel free as always to, to respond as you feel fit. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna take a moment and introduce myself. So I'm Stacy Allison Casson. Um, I'm a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario, uh, with my home community being the Georgian Bray, uh, sometimes called half-breed community, but I have um, long-standing connections up through the Upper Great Lakes and out through the historic Northwest. Um, and right now I'm coming to you from Oakville, Ontario, which is the territory of the uh, Mississauga the Credit First Nation. 
And I've also recently started a brand new position. I'm coming in as an assistant professor at the School of Information Management at Dalhousie University, uh, coming by way of uh, the iSchool at the University of Toronto, coming by way of uh, York University in Toronto, where I was an academic librarian uh, for, for many, many years. Um, and so thank you, Robin, for that. Um, start off, my mind already is going in many, many directions. Um, and in thinking about this, this question, um, you know, I was thinking about this, this issue of, of knowledge preservation and data governance and connection to the university. And I think because um, I'm coming from this library perspective, teaching information studies, teaching about things like um, data governance, Indigenous data sovereignty, and about the role of the university library in this uh, as well. So, you know, libraries and connections are like at the beginnings of university themselves. So we look also back to the sort of roots of the university as an entity. We're talking like way back in the sort of medieval university. The library is there as part of that whole system of or information system really of the university itself that that the library is this mechanism for not just information preservation and I think that's a really important part when we start talking about data and data governance it's not just the preservation it's actually the use it's the use of the of the data that is stored within the university for use by scholars or by um, students, and this is again when we look at that sort of continuum of what does the university in that settler colonial perspective do, and having that data be there as, as something that generates new discoveries and new knowledge, but really also focused on the individual. So there's, there's is a disconnect between the university and, and the people even in sort of settler colonial communities, it is a sort of separate entity. And the library as the store of, of data is part of that um, mechanism. And in thinking about what, what do we look at or think about these sort of violences that are done? I mean, I think it's part of that, like what are those purposes of that information? Who is controlling that data, what is its function, and seeing that university as a piece within that um, perpetuation of settler colonialism. And it still continues. So that is where I think it's important to also think about the difference between a library or the way that data is stored versus archives, because sometimes we conflate those things or think about archives and preservation as the same thing. But they're different when we talk about the use. And it's the use of that data that is also deeply problematic. So we have the, the who's collecting it, bringing it in and bringing it in to be used to do something or have some sort of impact as well that is, is disconnected from the community that it is um, potentially co collected from. So I think when we um, think about that, uh, or this in this conversation, it's important to also recognize that sort of historic continuum. Um, I'm looking at Carolyn, although she probably would. <laughs> I'm not a historian, but but to recognize that there's are there are these things that are perpetuated and they continue to be perpetuated and they have their roots in this in this sort of elite portion of society that is meant to keep that power into you know to themselves in this particular way. And so dismantling that is is not as um, it's, it's goes beyond just how we think of how something is held, but the whole the whole structure itself. So I think to me in reflecting on this um, question that was a really um, something I was really, thinking about or grappling with in terms of how we understand the university as well as an entity that is sort of complicit in this perpetuation of violence. And what does it mean for all of us who are potentially members of this organization when it is um, such a force in terms of how it is structured? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there, but um, that's some of my um, initial thoughts to that, to that question. 
Thank you, Stacey. Yeah, indeed, these are always are really big questions. And I think they're the most exciting, but then they demand these sort of big potentialities and responses. So I'll pass it to Carolyn um, to take it from here. Um, <clears throat> Annie Bojo, uh, Carolyn Padruchny, Dijnikaz, Oakville, Dunjaba. Uh, my name is Carolyn Padruchny, and um, I also hail from Oakville, Ontario, along with Stacy. And I introduced myself uh, a little bit using Anishinaabewin, which is the language that Robin introduced herself with, uh, because I live on this land and I feel uh, responsible to the stewards um, of this land. So I want to introduce myself as a settler colonist. My um, great grandparents and my um, and some of my grandparents came to Canada uh, right around the turn of the 20th century and they settled in western Manitoba on land that was um, tended to and stewarded by Anishinaabe people and also Cree or Nehewa people. Um, and uh, then I uh, ended up moving to uh, the Toronto area. Uh, so um, I grew up on Treaty 1 territory and then now I'm um, uh, covered by um, a little bit by the Toronto Purchase, but there's two um, treaties that are uh, ongoing with the Mississauga of the Credit um, First Nation. Um, I believe it's treaties uh, 44 and 45 in, in Oakville right now that are uh, currently in the courts. So um, I um, see myself very much as a guest on these lands and someone who has benefited from colonialism um, as someone who is um, white skinned and uh, is considered white. And I keep that at the forefront in my position of power as an educator in a university, a major urban university. So I'm a professor in the history department. Um, I decided to, um, when I arrived, it's a, it's a fairly conventional history department. We didn't have a lot of Indigenous history. Um, I decided to create courses in Indigenous history um, as part of um, uh, trying to be someone who's responsible and responsive to the past and uh, to fight for social justice in our society. And I really um, take seriously um, the injustices that have been felt by the many Indigenous peoples who have lived in Canada and have tried to do my best to uh, make spaces. Uh, so as a non-Indigenous person who is teaching Indigenous histories, I recognize my role as someone who needs to step, step aside. So I'm always, I've always got that goal post in mind and I've been cultivating um, as many indigenous students as possible within the university. And uh, as we continue to strive to hire um, indigenous educators in our department. Um, so I do want to um, step back a little bit as a historian and just sort of think a little bit about the deep past. I want to thank Robin and Stacy so much for their brilliant answers and uh, oh, they're so smart. So I'm going to be less smart and more boring, but just sort of to put it into a historical context, which is what I'm always trying to do. So definitely, as uh, Stacy was saying, universities started as these um, institutions that were elitist. Um, they really took off uh, during the Enlightenment in Europe, and they started to become organized in according to Enlightenment principles. And Enlightenment principles really um, value individualism over uh, collectivities. They like to break down the world into little bits and only the little bits that can be perceived of by, um, you know, the frail human five senses of, you know, touch, taste, sound, sight, feel. Um, and that got reflected in a couple of ways in universities developing distinct disciplines to ask questions in certain ways and categorize things in certain ways. And it also um, is reflected in the way that data is thought about and the evidence is thought about in that it has to be perceived in a certain way. It has to be gathered in a certain way. It has to be analyzed in a certain way in a repeatable experimental kind of way. So all of these, um, this approach, this enlightenment approach, which structured universities um, really undermines other knowledge systems. And so um, it, it's, it's caused violence to all kinds of knowledge systems, but especially to indigenous knowledge systems. Uh, Robin's already um, mentioned the importance of interdisciplinarity 
with Indigenous knowledge systems. One thing I hope to talk about a little bit later on in our hour together is the history of um, the field of Indigenous studies, which has created a crack in university, um, uh, university structures to allow Indigenous knowledge systems to enter and grow. They've come in in other ways, especially in environmental studies, but I think they've had the most traction with um, Indigenous studies programs. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. We got Thank you, Carolyn and Robin and Stacy. I think I think again these um, these larger questions. It's really a nice way to settle in, but then it's really hard to pinpoint, you know, sort of exact um, answers and even to form the linkages between multiple different um, possibilities that these questions evoke. Um, I'd like to take into a little bit of a. Um, interesting direction that I think has emerged from the previous sessions as well. Um, I'm going to leave this, I'm going to leave my little preamble a little bit shorter um, just for time, but I'm going to pass this to Stacy now. And my question really is centered around the relationship between Indigenous knowledge sovereignty and academia. Um, I think what we've been trying to figure out in these last sessions is what would these reciprocal responsible relationships look like between the two? Is there a way to form this sort of just and equitable and liberatory relationship um, between academia and between Indigenous knowledge sovereignty and data sovereignty? Um, and if this is possible, what are the sort of starting points for us to build these relationships? Like what is necessary for us to do to build just relationships between Indigenous knowledge and the university space? So I'd like to pass it to Stacy, and then we can, we can kind of see where this takes us. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, huge question, right? I think, and I think it's the the perpetual question of, I mean, certainly, how how is this possible? I think it it is in many ways there is, I believe, at this time, certainly acknowledgement in many many institutions that this is some something that needs to. Oh, I do not want to use the word solve, but but you know that there needs to be paid attention to. Um, and that is good. Um, and I was, again, thinking about this question and earlier this um, summer slash spring, we had the Knowledge, Equity and Justice Spring Seminar for graduate students. And we had um, Dr. Alan Oshay Corbier come in and, and give a talk. And, and he was talking about the relationship between documents and archives and um, an experience with uh, courts going into the courts uh, often with a with a, a case specifically around treaty or or land and and he was talking about this word incommensurable about the difference between systems of sort of a settler colonial system and an in indigenous knowledge systems that this is why I cannot not talk with my hands but where there there is just there it it is incommensurable and thinking about that word incommensurable that they are separate and different and there's no no joining together in some mesh that is going to somehow be perfect. And so we are left with this imperfect space that we need to move forward with. And, but what does that mean? Because there's no bringing indigenous knowledge into a settler colonial system and having that be just and, and, you know, keeping the, the, um, sort of wholeness of an indigenous knowledge system sort of nested in a, a, a colonial system. It's just, it's just not possible. And so it's a real um, challenge because it is also necessary that universities grapple with, with this. It's, it's not, again, something that is, is just attached to um, um, the system. So I'm really thinking about that uh, alignment and this sort of fundamental lack of ability. I know this is probably sounding like, but where's the solution? So that I think the problem is I don't know what the solution is, except to say we need to, it's an ongoing process. And there are um, things that are happening uh, like the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, um, you know, the work that's going on there and other places that is leading to spaces. And as Carolyn was mentioning in indigenous studies where we see that there are these cracks to saying, okay, we have to think differently about, and that's where I was sort of gesturing back to what, what is the university? Because we have to recognize that the university isn't 
a you know space necessarily of liberation or celebration of knowledge or all good things that there are some really deep structural things going on and we have to look at that and address that and then all those tendrils that come out from that so for example systems of uh, reward within universities so when you hire indigenous scholars how is their work being um ranked or or considered because certainly part of the university system is the tenure system and that most tenure processes in universities do not align even with thinking about what uh, indigenous researchers are are doing or work that is tends to be more activist or community based so there's a university may say that that is a value but it doesn't necessarily equal to a system that is is in many ways hostile to um, other forms of knowledge in that in that way that um, recognizes what is valued, right? And that's another problem when we talk about um, injustice at the form of epistemologies. When knowledge is not valued, uh, it is very clear in the university in these kinds of cases. So I feel like I've I feel like I've strayed a little bit from. <laughs> your initial question but it's again really looking at the university as a whole to say it's not about necessarily having a policy on how only on how the policy on how data is handled that's one tiny part of a whole thing that needs to to recognize indigenous knowledge and sovereignty as well is so important to recognize indigenous nations and nationhood in a, in a very uh, particular way if you're are not doing that then it sort of um, stretches out to all kinds of different things. So it's a few things to mention, but again, I wanna go back to this incommensurable word because I think we have to recognize that there is incommensurability. And so what does that mean for a solution when it's not as simple as incorporating something into the sort of system of the university in a way that is simple and comfortable because, uh, because it's not. So thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Definitely, definitely. There's a lot of fuzziness, I think, that's being evoked, and that fuzziness demands certain things be unknowable, um, etc. So I'd like to pass it to Carolyn to respond. I know these are big, big things, but hopefully we can have big, big answers as well. Sure. Okay. So thank you so much, Stacey, for starting us off, and thank you, Kanishka, for guiding us along. Um, Oh, I have to tell a tenure story. But before I do that, I just want to point out a couple of other big issues that, that we need to consider when we're asking this question about the relationship between Indigenous knowledge, sovereignty, and academia. So, of course, not all universities are the same, but they're kind of the same, built along the same structure. But if we look at Indigenous knowledge systems, there's so many and they're so different. I just want to remind everybody, people probably know this, but it's good to just sort of, you know, think about it. There's uh, approximately 370 million Indigenous peoples in the world, depending on how you count what is Indigenous. There's estimates of 5,000 distinct Indigenous groups speaking um, roughly 4,000 distinct languages, representing roughly 6% of the global population. So, the word indigenous didn't really come into uh, mainstream use uh, uh, at, in, a, in a global way on a global stage really until after World War II. And it was only through uh, not-for-profit organizations, the International Labor Organization, for example, that started to really work towards uh, fighting for indigenous rights. Uh, we see some early work then being done by the United Nations, which culminated in the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People that was passed in 2007, even though Canada didn't sign on initially, nor did the United States, nor did Australia or New Zealand, but they have signed on uh, subsequently. Um, so we start to see that there's this recognition of indigeneity within um, Western societal structures and non-Western societal structures as well, uh, global um, nation structures, I guess. Um, but there's no agreement on what the word indigenous means and what is accepted as an indigenous knowledge system. So I just wanna throw that out there. 
um, I have already mentioned um, Indigenous studies emerging as a discipline. I want to say that they definitely benefited and followed in the footsteps of activists. And it's really been Indigenous activists in communities where Indigenous knowledge systems have been healthy, growing, developing for thousands and thousands of years. And these activists recommend, uh, representing their communities are the ones who fought fought the good fight for these changes to start to happen in terms of nation state structures and university structures. Uh, so we see this coming into Indigenous studies programs that were paralleled by um, what are called in North America tribal colleges, and they're called that in other places around the world as well. But these are Indigenous controlled uh, educational institutions. Um, so um, I won't go on too much about Indigenous studies right now, other than to say that it's always been characterized by interdisciplinarity. It's always been characterized as being borderless, not recognizing borders of the nation state. And it's always involved a commitment to Indigenous communities uh, continuing in that activist tradition. Uh, so I think those are where we're starting to find some answers. But there's oh so many problems. So Stacy brought up tenure. I have to tell a tenure warning story to everybody um, who's on the call. And I see that there's a lot of people here. So I'm a non-Indigenous person. I've gone through tenure and promotion. I've been promoted to fall. But at every stage along the way, and I've worked with a lot of different Indigenous communities, I had a really hard time representing any kind of advocacy work that I did uh, with or community-based um, research with Indigenous communities in my tenure and promotion file, because these, you know, Senate rules or regulations would only support a certain kind of evidence of productivity um, or development of knowledge. So as a real practical example, um, uh, I was unable to include letters from elders with whom I've worked, Indigenous elders, uh, because it would be highly inappropriate for that letter to be um, requested by someone who the elder didn't know, it had to, the request had to come from me, but then it was considered tainted by our Senate policies because I interfered with the process of getting the letter. So now um, uh, Stacy mentioned one of our colleagues, um, Alan Corbier, who uh, is a colleague of mine in the history department who has yet to go up for tenure. So I'm striving hard to change those tenure rules so that he won't face those same setbacks because you know, the lion's share of his work takes place within community and then is going to be considered tainted by our stupid Senate regulations about tenure and promotion. So many little details like that within the universities all over the place. This is just one I want to call attention to. And just one more quick thing. So um, non-Indigenous allies can help Indigenous allies within universities by leaning out, looking for these problems, and trying to um, fix and smooth the path as much as possible and take risks in their own careers to do those kinds of things. Okay, thanks, Miigwech. Thank you, Carolyn. And I know I'm kind of um, directing folks here, but if folks want to jump in at any point in response, that's totally cool. Um, but I'll pass it to Robin now to kind of take us into, I think, a direction that we've been going in, and in, in terms of kind of our own practices and methods in this work. So I'll pass it to you, Robin. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the, are you jumping to the next question? I'm still thinking about the knowledge, sovereignty, and academia question. Is that okay? Definitely, yeah, keep it okay. there. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about, if we look back at settler arrival and um, Euro colonists that were simply not prepared for the terrains of Turtle Island or the Americas when they got here. And so particularly, um, you know, what would be called eventually Canada, right? So they showed up here and they were cold and dying and didn't know how to take care of themselves. And, you know, it's, it's rough terrain out here, imagine before industrialization. Um, and so Indigenous knowledges at that time were taken in order to simply survive here, right? So they, the, it, was, it was Indigenous people who showed them how to, you know, use beaver pelts and things like that for staying warm and how to survive on these rough terrains. And so we think through history and the systems that um, have evolved throughout that time, uh, arguably not much has changed. 
right? Like in terms of our goals, in terms of our objectives, um, like Euro colonist descendants today and the system, the entire system that this world was built upon is it's built on colonialism. So it's, and it's built on extraction and it's built on ensuring the continued survival of settlers to the detriment of others. And so sovereignty today and, and in the data space, the research space and institutions, it's really being used as a little bit of a buzzword, I would say, um, without actually full accountability. We're, we're not actually accounting for real genuine change because we are continuing to perpetuate the same narrative that got us here. Hey, I'm cold, I need your help. Hey, we're having all these health crises, I need your data. Um, so when we're failing to account for this lack of genuine change, it, it, it ends up being that, you know, it's extractive at the end of the day. So we, we often hear things like indigenous inherent rights and, um, we know of government initiatives that claim to respect those rights, but uh, that respect it just doesn't surpass the point where genuine and meaningful change could actually occur. Instead, in many instances, they're still being delivered as lip service. And again, in many cases, um, this is happening without Indigenous people even realizing or without non-Indigenous people, like society is not realizing. And, and an example of that is actually the UNDRIP. And so when the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, you know, was, was launched in 2007, everybody thought, yeah, wow, that's great. Um, we're going to have, we're going to have rights in all these really, really important areas that would ensure uh, continued survival and, and an expansion of our, um, you know, so many things that have been taken. But um, something that really had the potential to create a lot of change in Canada was cast. Um, in, in as the UNDRIP Act, or as I think it was originally supposed to be the UNDRIP Act, that was actually squashed in Parliament when it was being put forward by Indigenous people. And the government of Canada, in the middle of the pandemic crisis, managed to pass a new UNDRIP Act. And um, what I think we're, we're missing when we read it, because if you've ever had, there's 46 articles, and they're all kind of like, Indigenous people have the right to, Indigenous people have the right to, and if, if you ever sat back and tried to read the UNDRIP, you might get bored or, or not make it all the way to number 46. Number 46 is the very last article in the UNDRIP, and that was added at the last minute before anybody would sign on to it, and it says, nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as implying for any state, people, group, or person any right to engage in any activity or to perform any act contrary to the Charter of the United Nations or construed as authorizing or encouraging any act which would dismember or impair totally or in part the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. My interpretation of that is nothing in this declaration means a damn thing outside of the current colonial system. And so when understanding that and putting that and like recognizing like what a real genuine sign show of good faith would be, the system that we live in requires complete redistribution of power and a complete overhaul and a, and a um, you know, the seven grandfather teachings, if you're familiar at all, that, that speaks to honesty and speaks to truth. It's so important it's said twice. Um, and we need to be honest with ourselves and our institutions and the positions that we're in, in order to actually push forward and start actually making real genuine change. And I think institutions are really in a powerful position. They have the ability to start um, pushing for things like what Carolyn, Carolyn speaks to, like cracks, or maybe we call them like glimpses of sovereignty, but things where you know, we really are pulling in more faculty and we really are pulling in more, more students and we are actually doing things that create long lasting meaning, meaningful change by bringing in those different perspectives and bringing in people who have lived experiences that change the way they view the world. And by doing that, you know, we'll start to see societal shifts in thinking that are really necessary in order to dismantle what we're currently living in. And, and it requires being critical and accountable and reflective and decolonial and, and really doing the system change work that acknowledges how difficult it is. And speaking to, again, the way Carolyn just shared and um, her, her tenure experience, 
and as a um as a as a first nations woman who recently completed a phd i also sent out uh, a very very many applications to universities for faculty positions i've been teaching for several years i feel i am prepared to come in the door as a faculty and i had many an interview and was told by every single university that got back to me that because i was unable to move i have four children born and raised in these territories this is where my relationships and research are and i was told by every one of those universities we will not let you come to our university because you can't move here if you won't move we can't take you and how are we going to create the change where i can say but wait if I can teach at a distance, COVID taught us, we can do this at a distance. If I can teach at a distance, you don't think that I could create some curriculum that could actually bring in Black and Indigenous students who can't leave their territories because they have responsibilities, because they have families. And, um, you know, and, and that just happened, you know, that just happened this past year to me. And so it, it's so speaking to the system that still exists that isn't willing to bend even a little bit to make the kinds of space for people who come in and be critical. Thank you much. Yes, as Carolyn was doing, applause. Um, I think there is so much there um, that it's difficult to see where to go. Um, I think, you know, one of our next questions and that, you know, myself and the panelists were going through, um, we're thinking about what, what it would mean to rebuild these institutions. What would it look like concretely? What are the sort of strategies that we would um, take? And so I want to just pose that out there, um, you know, Carolyn mentored, mentioned tenure, how tenure processes need to change. Robin mentioned how, you know, the system needs to be overhauled, um, you know, how distance education needs to be, you know, prioritized, what it means to, you know, um, be forced to move, you know, every few years as academia demands. And so I want to kind of put this out there. Maybe we can start at Carolyn, um, who started us off with the tenure process. What would it really look like to rebuild these institutions? What would you want to see in them? What do you think is sort of necessary for the you know, for Black and Indigenous peoples in particular to thrive in these institutional spaces that are, um, you know, have their legacies rooted in these violences. Um, I want to draw your attention to scholarship on this particular question. And there's one of my favorite articles is uh, written by a couple of people from the University of Alberta. One is Adam Godry, who's Métis, uh, just like Stacy, And one is a non-Indigenous person named Danielle Lorenz. And they did a big um, sort of survey of Indigenous academics across Canada. I think both located with commu within communities and within universities. And they kind of came up with a three model approach uh, to being able to integrate Indigenous knowledge into existing Canadian universities. And so the first model that they saw happening was um, simply something called Indigenous inclusion, which is basically just adding Indigenous people and mixing. So that's hiring Indigenous people into, um, you know, university, academic, Western conceived positions, giving them, you know, academic, university, Western conceived uh, pedagogy and saying, okay, go. Um, so obviously that, that doesn't work, you know, it's just like brown facing or, or whatever. Um, I do think there's some merit there because the more critical mass you have of Indigenous people existing within universities, the more that they can start to make change from within. So I, I am an incremental kind of person. I mean, I try to always uh, be, um, you know, optimistic, even in the face of all these endless frustrations. And as uh, Robin so eloquently pointed out, the fact that our society continues to be, uh, you know, see built on colonialism on the backs of indigenous people uh and that it, nothing's changing you know especially like you know article 46 of undrip thank you for telling us all about that um so the second model they talk about is um <laughs> reconciliation indigenation so there's a whole lot of reconciliation going on in canada sort of not really maybe people talk about it all the time um i just call it middle grounding and that's trying to find uh, a consensus on what counts as knowledge, 
how to reconcile indigenous and European derived knowledges, uh, determining the types of relationships that academic communities sh uh, should have with indigenous communities. And I think that there's um, a little bit of that going on in different places in different universities, especially through individual instructors who are um, working within the context of communities and taking classes to communities, bringing communities to classes and um, trying to weave or knit something together. But it's always left lacking, you know, uh, because we always have these Senate policies. Like there's, uh, you know, my university has a, an Indigenous council, but it does not have an Indigenous a committee on Senate, for example. Um, so the third model, which was the mo by far the most popular among everybody surveyed, all the Indigenous academics surveyed um, by um, Adam Godry and Daniel Lorenz, is what they call um, decolonial indigenization. Uh, and this is where everybody wants to see a wholesale overhaul of the academy to fundamentally reorient knowledge production uh, based on balancing power relations uh, between Indigenous people and Canadians to transform the academy into something dynamic and new. So, you know, I have seen little bits of this happening in places where, for example, undergraduate students coming in don't have to declare a major. What they do is they declare a project they want to work on conducted in an interdisciplinary fashion with scholars from across the university, and people sort of can move through and train like that. Um, but no one, university um, administrators do not want to give up their power. They do not want to see a wholesale change. Um, and so this is incredibly difficult. We did have the experiment in Canada of um, having a First Nations run university that lasted for roughly 15 years or so. Um, I th I, I'm not sure if it's still ongoing or if it's, it's, um, it's it's defunct. It was um, in Saskatchewan. May, uh, maybe uh, Stacy and um, Robin can uh, know more than I do. Um, so I think a lot of Indigenous people are now actually trying to uh, go back to tribal colleges or Indigenous ac academic institutions and to build capacity within those places and get those accredited. So I know Ontario actually four years ago created uh, um, an Indigenous accreditation agency that accredits Indigenous post-secondary institutions to have their degrees recognized. So um, I, that's, that's where Godry and Lorenz fall, uh, fall on the side of that there really isn't a way to make this work. Um, I, I don't know if I agree with them. Um, I don't know how young people are feeling. I know that a lot of, um, you know, young PhD students in uh, Indigenous PhD students in my university are not at all happy uh, with the structures of everything, the courses, the comprehensive exams, the requirements of the dissertation. And it doesn't seem to me like my colleagues are willing to really make genuine changes um, at this point. So uh, I, you know, I'm just, so I'm sorry to be ending with an, I don't know. Um, I can give you a whole bunch of specific examples of things I've, I've tried to do. Let me just say out there to all the non-Indigenous people, um, ask questions of your Indigenous colleagues. Be willing to um, walk your talk. Be willing to put yourself out there. Lean out and um, risk take risks. Um, you're safer because you're non-Indigenous uh, than your Indigenous colleagues. And you can fight for change, um, taking guidance from your ind Indigenous colleagues. Uh, okay, I'll stop there and uh, hand it over to, uh, back to Kanishka. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I'm just going to pass it over for time. Um, Stacy, any, any thoughts on that? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I wrote down uh, a little bit early this, uh, this idea of sort of radical hope. So I think, you know, it's a, ch it's a challenge. I mean, I've been in sort of moving from being a librarian into being, um, faculty. So, so teaching in library and information studies versus being a librarian, and it's interesting being on sort of what two different sides of kind of work within the university. And, you know, having conversations 
with students. So that's one wonderful thing about teaching. I always find is you have this ability to open up conversations in the classroom and really, um, you know, get get students thinking about about what is that future we can all hope and work towards. But the the question often is, but what do we do or how do we do it? And and I I think the thing is there's no easy path. There's no pathway that's also necessarily obvious that that is to be taken because as, as was mentioned there's resistance there is truly no there is there is not as much as we hear certainly in Canada about reconciliation and indigenization it's not that that is actually um, what most university administrators want to see in the future and so it can be really challenging to and depends too on your position within the university as to, to where that is. So I have this word written down, sort of this idea of radical hope. And, you know, I know this was gonna come up a little bit later, but I'm currently reading this um, book, Community uh, as Rebellion, Communities as Rebellion um, by Lourdes Garcia Pena, as I get ready to teach uh, shortly, working on my syllabus. So thinking about how we, how we teach um, and, sort of what we can do in the classroom, considering there are regulations, right? We, we don't necessarily, as much as we have academic freedom, there are policies around what, what can we do? What do we have to document as learning outcomes? What does that mean? So there are lots and lots of structures and policies in the university, um, which is sometimes can be helpful, but can also be used as mechanisms to prevent, uh, to prevent change. And so um, one thing I think is important to recognize too, so grassroots action is super important, but policy is really important as well. So how, as you especially, again, if you are um, non-Indigenous, it doesn't, again, you can be in the library, be a librarian or archivist, and also pay attention to that Senate policy, to policy as a whole. What can you do to make, um, substantive change or small change even to policy because that actually is what will be held up is like well you can do this or your research can count in this way or you can do this in the class depending on what that policy is so join those senate subcommittees um <laughs> you have to have that opportunity and you want to want to make change it can be actually joining things like senate subcommittees and being um thinking about ways to, to um, be brave maybe in some of those spaces, because it can be, honestly, can be intimidating um, when you are in a, even when you're tenured, I'll just say, <laughs> even as a tenured person, it can be, it can feel a bit, uh, a bit scary. So, so that's, that's um, some things I would say um, as well. And thinking about, you know, there are, always things that can be done and and gestures even of um there's challenges also with consultation so we hear a lot certainly in Canada about consultation but those consultations um also put a lot of um burden on Indigenous communities so um I said beginning so I'm, I'm a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario I was active in my own um, although there are no Métis people in the Toronto area, we do have um, Métis for Ontario has, um, you know, community resources and um, sort of being active in there. And I know very well there are very few people that are constantly being asked to join advisory councils or join this or ask. And, and so being, um, trying to balance between consultation and thinking about what it means to, um, um be able to do that in a sort of responsible and respectful way so again no no solid solid answers because i think it's not always obvious or easy or or you start trying to do something and have to sort of go back and rethink uh those things but i uh, but i will say i'll go back to my radical hope part because i think things are are substantively different certainly from what i'm seeing currently um, from when I started uh, actually at York University way back in 2015, 2015, although that would be that long ago, 2005, things are quite, I would say, quite different. And it, and um, so I'm hopeful in, in that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Stacey. Yeah, having, being at York, and as Carolyn said, going through comprehensive exams, doing my dissertation proposal, and now working on my dissertation, I feel very regulated by the academy as well, and also, you know, given a lot of hope as well for change. Um, so I'll pass it to Robin. I know we're nearing, we've got five minutes left. And so I'd really love um, to hear Robin's thoughts on this. So we'll pass it to you. Thank you. Um, so for me, I think that we really need to focus more of our efforts, but without giving us more work, because I think we all have enough of that, but really like giving, giving the space and the opportunity to really, truly, genuinely understand our history, because I don't personally believe that we can move past it until we start to actually change the way people think. People, this, the system, as much as, you know, we might want to believe that we're separate from it, and we might want to believe that we don't have bias and we don't have embedded racism and things like that. I think that there's a lot of discomfort and that discomfort and the power shifts and just that unknowing um, and the uncertainty of change. I mean, as an Indigenous person, I have conversations with people and every time I have conversations with non-Indigenous people about really critical, really radical ideas, I get pushed back and I get told, yeah, but did you consider this? Yeah, but just, and it's just like, you just need to understand. I can't, I can't have conversations with you because you need to go read a book. You just need to go pick something up and, and unlearn a little bit. And I think that in order to better balance in um, the institution that we really need to be focusing more attention to unlearning so many of the things that we have been wrongfully taught and that have been purposefully taught to us that way um, in order for us to move forward so that we don't continue to make changes without the full picture and create policies without actually understanding how those policies and how those changes are actually perpetuating the exact thing you're trying to prevent. And that's my thoughts. Thank you, Robin. Maybe we can, um, we've been ending the sessions off um, with kind of the, I just dropped my pen, um, with, um, thinkings, people, books, resources um, that have influenced the thinking of the of you lovely folks and that you'd like to recommend for those that are here. So maybe Robin, we can start off with you. Maybe if folks just want to take a minute to, because we don't have much time left, maybe just a minute to share some resources they'd like to, they'd like others to sure. engage with. Sure. Um, the person that comes to mind in terms of like methods, if you're looking for some really, um, interesting and and new methods amy bombay has some really interesting work especially around like how to how to do in like longitudinal studies in ways that are not just like following a person for seven years or ten years but like uh in an in indigenous lens on the longitudinal study where they're following that that those people for life um it's such a radical approach to doing indigenous research another individual another amy actually amy shawanda she's um also a postdoc but she is doing some really fabulous writing around uh, a method that i use myself which is dreaming and so kind of you know dismantling our current colonial notions around what is considered pure science and pure research and in terms of like just my, where I come from as a person and my own thinking, uh, Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Mass Destruction, take a gander at that, and Kate Crawford's Atlas of AI. Thank you, Robin. Stacy, if you'd like to share. Sure, I'll try and be really quick. So again, I was talking about how I was reading, uh, or I'm currently reading Community as Rebellion. So uh, just as we're um, said, coming up to this, uh, I brought my stack of books so I would remember um, partly what I'm like they're on my bookshelf so so the other one I'm I'm sort of continuing to make my sure my way through is is Hungry Listening by Dylan Robinson so I have a music background and um, sort of thinking also about the ways that uh, Indigenous music sort of really sort of comes up against Western music but also to me has some things to say about the uh, academy which can be useful and I'm also just going to say fiction so reading indigenous fiction really great way also to sort of think about different um, worldviews or ways of looking at the world that can actually um, influence uh, ways that we think about 
uh, ways to approach research as well. So I'm just going to do a general plug for, for reading fiction, even though sometimes it might not seem to be very useful when we talk about uh, research. Thank you, Stacey. And Carolyn, I'll pass it to you. Sure, I'll just mention two classics. I always like going back to classics. So one is Linda Tuahi Smith, Decolonizing Methodologies. She is a Maori scholar and she first published this in 1999 and it keeps getting re-released. Uh, Margaret Kovach also has a wonderful book on indigenous methodologies uh, and she's based in Canada. And then finally, every uh, non-indigenous person needs to read an article called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor by um, Tuck and Yang. So decolonization is not a metaphor. Everybody must read. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. And some questions were if we could get all these resources and, and put them into an actual email, because I agree, it's it's hard to keep track of them. So we'll definitely do that as well. Um, and as as uh, Robin was actually speaking, I was thinking about um, lesbian Mohawk theorist, Beth Brandt, who has a lot of wonderful writing as well that may connect to those um, who are interested in this session and are here. So we'll end it here, because we're one minute over. Um, thank you, Robin, Carolyn, Stacy, for being here. Um, um, thanks for all the participants that have come. Um, we hope that you'll share the recording. The transcript is useful and we'll get those resources out to you as well. Um, so thank you. Take care. See you all soon.